Hey, you guys, welcome to this week's edition of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week, I am bringing on a very special guest. I'm excited about this. This is what I always say, isn't it? <laughs> this one's really fun because we're really going to dive into something that's very near and dear my heart, and that is traditional cooking. But this time we're going to be doing it with an Asian flair. So this is a lot of fun. We're going to be talking to Sophia Eng, who is the author of brand new Nourishing Asian Kitchen. If you guys have not seen this book, you're really going to want to check it out. So before I bring Sophia on, I just want to tell you a little bit about her. Tim and Sophia were born and raised in Silicon Valley, but with the events of 2020, they upped their homesteading game and moved across the country to the Appalachian Mountains. They're now raising and harvesting their own food, homeschooling their children, and using their hands to build a modern homestead with ancient Asian traditions. Oh, how fun. It's their mission to help shape the way the next generation views food, cooking, and proper stewardship of land and health. In the last year, Sophia has authored the Nourishing Asian Kitchen Cookbook alongside with her mother, based on Weston A. Price principles of ancestral eating, and it has over 100 recipes of nutrient-dense recipes for health and for healing. Sally Fallon Morell, who you guys all know and love, has written the foreword of the book, and it's been endorsed by all sorts of amazing people, including Joel Salatin. So I'm super excited to bring Sophia in to visit with us. Hello, Sophia. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Carolyn. Thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, this is going to be a great conversation. Now, I just really want to kick it off right at the very beginning by saying, what what is traditional cooking? For those of the people of my listeners here who may be new to this term, and they're like, I'm seeing this all over the place. Um, what does that mean? For me, it means cooking from scratch and replacing everything that we were using from Asian sauces and spices and condiments that we were buying. And even though we were cooking them at home and making homemade meals, it wasn't traditional. I mean, if you think about how our cultures were eating back in Asia, we didn't have access to the grocery store to buy you know, our hoisin sauce, for example, in the grocery <laughs> store. And so it's been a 12 year journey for me to go back and really start from our sauces and condiments. And that's the back to basics chapter in the cookbook. Yeah, that's really neat. You know, there's, there's, what we think of as like home cooked in our or cooked from scratch in our modern culture, which is kind of like, yeah, I'm the one who opened the box and dumped it in. Right. And then there's real traditional from scratch cooking where we're starting with all ingredient, like nothing that has ingredients in it. They are the ingredients yep. and we're building a lot of nutrition into the food. And this is just I think the best thing that could happen to our modern culture right now pretty much is to reintroduce our taste buds to what real nutrition tastes like and nutrient dense foods really taste like. Um, okay, so I got excited. I'm like diving straight in, but I, I want to check with you. Here I am in far north Idaho right now. We're expecting um, negative 24 degrees Fahrenheit as a low. Uh, over the next couple of days. And so we're like hunkering down. This is really cold even for us way up here. Um, we've got about two feet of snow on the ground right now. <laughs> so we're we're kind of in different parts of the United States. What's going on right now in your area of the country? Yeah. So I think we're entering this Arctic freeze that happens People said it hasn't happened in 20 years, but for the first, for the two years that we've been here, this is our second Arctic freeze where it's <laughs> dropping uh, to the single digits and probably going to get colder tomorrow, Thursday. So it, it is pretty cold, but I mean, typically in Tennessee, we have our proper four seasons and it's been, it's very nice when you get to spring and fall, summer gets a little bit hot, um, but winter can get pretty cold. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're experiencing the cold too. So it's not all like warm and toasty. I picture everybody in the South right now and I'm like, oh, I bet they have sun and it's warm, <laughs> but no, we're just all frozen this time of year. Aren't we? Especially this year. Yeah. I think this year and this time of year for sure. <laughs> 
Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your homesteading journey, because you are like so many of us, like coming, Josh and I are from Southern California originally. And, uh, you know, so we've all had our journeys kind of leaving city, leaving, you know, the modern life behind in a lot of ways. Yeah. What has your journey looked like? Well, our, it started off as a food journey. We didn't know what homesteading was or that it was a term or that it was now a thing. But 12 years ago when my daughter was born, I started wanting to make our food from scratch with her. For some reason, I felt like, let's just start with applesauce because in our culture, we just don't cook our fruit. And it was it seems it's a very simple recipe, right? You just steam and cook some apples and mash it up and blend it. But I really had to start from scratch. And so that's to just kind of tell you um, what a journey it's been. <laughs> <laughs> but even from there, I had these baby books that were handed down to me as a first time mom and these a book from William Sonoma. It said, make sure that when you source your apples, you source organic because your baby's body is not yet developed enough to process the toxic chemicals from the herbicides and the pesticides. And 12 years ago in our culture, if I were to say I went and shopped at Whole Foods, it's just a taboo thing. It's, you know, she's irresponsible with her finances. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you, I, I, we, we didn't quite make it there yet, I guess. But because of that experience, I said, okay, well, fine, I'll go into Whole Foods, I'll buy the organic apples. But at what point do we, is her body going to be developed enough for her to eat our conventional food that we buy in, in our Asian grocery stores? Or are we doing something wrong? And it's now been 12 years and we have our own <laughs> five acres worth of farming. We have our own micro dairy now and we have our, we raise all of our protein, our meat, and we have our garden, but it's been a journey. We, from there, we started on a quarter acre in the Bay area right before 2020. And I really felt this, um, it was like a real big push. And I kept hearing like, prepare, 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 and specifically around food. So I didn't know what that meant. I just said, okay, well, then I'll start growing my own garden. And my mom, she always said, if you're going to make pho, which is the, the soup that's on the cover of the book, she said, if you're going to make pho, you have to make it with cilantro and scallion. Otherwise, don't bother making it. And this is like Asian mom, so I can still hear her voice very clearly. And she, so I, so I said, okay, fine. So outside of our quarter acre home, we had a small three bedroom, one bath house. I planted a little planter bed and all, I had learned how to succession plant the cilantro and the scallion, which grew pretty much all year round in California. I could grow that. I can't do that here because it just bolts so quickly. But we did that in California. And that was the first time that I really felt I really could taste the difference with homegrown cilantro. And it transformed our dishes from just a simple herb that I felt in 2019, I felt, okay, we can, we can do this. And so I built out four garden beds from there. And by the time March 2020 happened, we already had our full garden ready to go. Um, March 16, 2020 in California, everything shut down. We were, we had lockdowns, we had curfews, and I'd never heard of this before. My parents are from Vietnam. They left Vietnam at the fall of Saigon. And so they would have so many stories growing up. I was born and raised again in, in um, San Jose in California. So we just knew America is America. I didn't hear, you know, so hearing my mom tell us scary stories about what happened during the fall of Saigon, I would often tell her, mom, can you just stop telling us these stories? It's never going to happen here. But March 16th, 2020 was when I told her, can you, can you tell us what happened? And that night I told Tim, my husband, I said, there was this woman in Marin County, which is north of San Francisco. She was selling egg laying hens. And um, I needed a protein source because we have our garden, but we didn't have any protein. Grocery stores shut down during that time. And I didn't know for how long. Um, you just don't know. And I had seven people. So our whole family quarantined with us. And uh, so I told Tim, I said, let's go. So we went and got these egg laying hens. I didn't know how to raise chicks. So I, we didn't have a chicken coop. So I said, just give me the hens. I want the eggs. Drove out there for an hour and a half. And she charged us. Three hundred dollars for uh, for one hen, and we oh. bought 
for three, one hen. <laughs> for one hen, and we bought three hens. <laughs> And uh, I remember driving back through the Bay Bridge, I told Tim, I never, ever want our family to be in a position again where we have to worry about feeding all of us with three eggs a day. Mm -hmm. And it was from that moment on that, you know, we really had to ask some really tough questions. We ended up buying six acres north of Sacramento um, to bring in some ruminant animals. So goats and sheep was what we introduced. We grew out our our flock. My husband bought a hundred (laughs) ducks. You know, because you're a brand new homesteader, you just jump all in. And uh, <laughs> but he loved he loved it. He's a West Point grad, went to Iraq for 18 months, and he served um, for 15 years. And I think it was the first time that I saw him really care at, for something other than our own family, but really take good care. And and I could see some healing in him managing our livestock. So I thought that was really cool. And he called them his little soldiers because everywhere he went, like these little ducklings would imprint and follow him. So he became the mama duck, <laughs> which made it impossible for him during harvest. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is so great. And, you know, you have so much in there that I think so many of us will identify with. I mean, right off, I was thinking our story really starts a lot with having our first child too. And just this like this light bulb moment of, you know, it's one thing to feed yourself just whatever you normally eat, whatever's convenient, whatever's at hand. But then all of a sudden when you have this little precious life that you're responsible for, you like, whoa, I know we can do better than this. I have to research. I have to know more. I have to do, you know, a good job. And that was really what set us off on our journey also. And uh, we didn't have COVID in the middle of our path uh, when we were learning, but there were a lot of similar trajectories of just like realizing how fragile the system was and how many people we were responsible for. And if our system of getting food for people was depending on a grocery store that was so close to, to being empty, right. you know, every single day it's close to being empty. Um, that for us was like, you started to get that kind of creepy skin crawly mm-hmm. feeling, you know, like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? Like, this is not safe. Why are we doing this? Right. And, you know, so very eye opening. So, um, you know, your, your $300 hens probably paid for themselves during COVID too, for as expensive as those eggs got. <laughs> <at that moment. laughs> yeah, exactly. <I> know. <laughs> oh. I, what an expensive lesson learned, you know, yeah. and I think I, I look back at that story and as upset as I was, I'm so grateful that that was the aha moment. We talk about it in tech, like, what is that moment that like changes your life? Like that was the moment. It wasn't so much like the shakeup of the grocery store. Cause you know, we had that with electricity, PG&E just shutting down our electricity. That wasn't scary enough. Earthquakes wasn't scary enough, but it wasn't until like there was no more food on the shelves um, that really woke us up. Yeah. 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 And now I'm sure you look back and you're like, whoo. That was close. Like, I'm glad we're where we are now because every step forward just feels, uh, it feels so good. And yet at the same time, it feels like, gosh, I wish we would have been here three years ago. (laughs) Like, I should be further ahead than I already am right now. But, you know, we have to celebrate the wins. We do. uh, That's so amazing. So I want to get back to this idea of the uh, traditional cooking because it goes so much hand in hand with homesteading or farming or, you know, whatever you want to call Uh, kind of getting back to the land and eating real food, real fresh food and um, and real nutrient dense food. Um, And something that really strikes me is how, you know, whether you look at Asian cultures or you look at, say, northern European cultures, or you look at all these different places, there are actually some real backbones of traditional foods that kind of stay the same, even if the flavors are a little different, the application is a little different. Mm -hmm. And I find that personally so incredibly fascinating. You know, the easy one that comes to mind on this is bone broth, right? Like uh, everybody makes bone broth practically when you look culture to culture. Now I shouldn't make some broad statement that everybody does because there's somebody who doesn't, I'm sure culturally, (laughs) but in a large majority of traditional cultures depend on some form of a bone broth. And, you know, are there any other ones that come to mind for you of some of these like kind of 
they cross cultures um, type of foods. Yeah, definitely bone broth is huge in their Asian culture, especially for the postpartum period. There's that 30 days that most Asian culture, I don't want to say all, but most Asian cultures are very strict in that, you know, what we call like the fourth trimester in healing, where you're just loaded with lots and lots of different types of bone broth. Um, but also one of the other things that I've noticed too, and especially with Sally Fallon's Nourishing Traditions book and flipping through that, because that's what opened up my eyes to this world as well, is the fermentation. Mm -hmm. A lot of our, and you'll see it too in, in our modern grocery stores, you're starting to see not just sauerkraut on the shelves, but you're starting to see kimchi and daikon, daikon chi, right? <laughs> Where um, all of these Asian influences of our food is starting to become, you know, more accepted, widely right. accepted. Um, but but this is, has been going on in our cultures for thousands of years. And even within the Asian cultures from the Vietnamese, Chinese has a different method of fermentation. Uh, Koreans, obviously, with the kimchi, so many different methods and different flavorings. But I mean, I just love how much biodiversity that adds to our gut health. And that's one of the other reasons why, you know, I have been looking for this book for the last 12 years when I found Sally Fallon's book, I was waiting for someone else to write it. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, but it's just like bringing this to awareness and making it acceptable to everyone is really key to improving all of our gut health, all of our health overall in general and bringing that tradition and, you know, back back in the day, we didn't have access to all of the health care that we do today, but they still lived arguably, you know, pretty healthy lives compared to where we are today. And so how do we bring back some of that? Now, I believe I appreciate technology where it makes sense. Like I love my freezer, love my refrigerator, <laughs> Um but there's a time and place for everything and there's a fine balance too. And, and I love, you know, there, there are some traditional things that I really felt like if I didn't document it from my mom and, and pass it on to my children, it was going to be lost. And mm -hmm. um, so it's been, you know, a, at least 12 years since we've lived this way, but 10 years since I've been wanting to write this cookbook with my mom, since we've been working on all of these recipes together and mom, try this. And, and she has a very uh, discerning palate. <laughs> so everything that I was making, I had to double check with her and I cleaned out all of our pantry to make sure, you know, this is all that I can cook with. If we're going to tinker, this is all that we could work with. And it has gotten to the cookbook today. And I'm so happy that I could share it with the world because it was just supposed to be a gift for mom and the girls um, last Christmas and, you know, go to FedEx, print it and then gift it to them, be done, go back to my full-time job. <laughs> Did not expect the, the um, every, you know, the, the world to receive it the, the way that it has. Oh, well, we're so excited that uh, you've let us share in on your gift to your family because it's so special to have that. Um, I love where you said that um, you started with the sauces. Yeah. And I think this is really important to notice, whether we're talking about an Asian kitchen or we're talking about kind of more standard American food, it's often the sauces, you know, the ketchup, the, the mayonnaise, the, you know, whatever the sauce is that you're going to put on your food or augment your food with, the, the, the different condiments, um, that's where a lot of really unhealthy stuff sneaks into our diet. You know, we're really aware of like what what's in this main dish package, or at least we're more aware of our main dishes and our side dishes than we are of the sauces that we use. So we get all this great food and then we dump, you know, some awful ketchup over it that just has a list of terrible ingredients on it. And so it's one of those things that like, when you start becoming aware of those smaller items, it really opens to your eyes to what you're actually putting into your body. What were some of the things that you felt like the most shocked about as you started paying attention to those things? I think the biggest thing that I hadn't realized, and this is not just with Asian spices, but with American spices too. I didn't look into the spice industry, but when we started raising our own animals, not just like the chicken, but now into our beef cattle where we're raising grass fed, grass finished beef, and it takes two years to finish them. And what you see on that front cover is the oxtail beef pho, which is my all time favorite. But there's oh, only one 
So yeah. See that there. <laughs> and there's only one oxtail per cow. So if you think about it, it takes two years for me to raise that oxtail to make this special dish. And then I looked into spices and typically I would go to the Asian. So as I cleaned everything up, I started cooking from scratch. I would still go to the Asian grocery store to buy the black cardamom because it was hard to find at an, an American grocery store. So the black cardamom, the cloves, the star anise, cinnamon, um, fennel and coriander you can find. But those other ones that are more tropical, they're harder to find. And so it wasn't until I started looking into the spice industry and realizing that our spices come, most of them come from overseas. And when they are shipped and cross over to the United States, it's sprayed with ethylene oxide. It's been irradiated. And so, uh, you know, and it's obviously not going to be organic or non-GMO. It's definitely going to be a GMO product. Um, I realized, oh my goodness. So here I am cooking a 24 hour bone broth with my oxtail pho. And then I'm putting all these spices that might have arsenic and lead in it with ethylene oxide and has been irradiated. Is this, you know, is this truly something that I want to be putting in? And so out of necessity, and we homeschool our children, I said, let's start packaging these up because we started making our own spices and where we buy them in bulk. And even the black cardamom is $100 a pound. Okay. And, um, and so I said, well, we you, we make a lot of pho broth at home. I have it on the stove now. I have it on the stove most days of the week, even throughout the summer. The kids love it. It's so easy to make. It's so nourishing. And so I started having them do it and, and making our own at home. But then as a project learning experience for their school, I said, well, let's start putting together a website and start selling it. And so for the last two, three, three years now, 2021, yeah, that's that's when they've been selling it. And now Polyface carries it. Um, a lot of our local like retailers and places, farms that understand the value of having these spices and appreciating just more nourishing Asian food. And it's very healing too. These, you know, you could take your bone broth and put the pho, spice mixes in there. And now you've got like a healing broth. And this is great for inflammation, um, decongestion, um, all sorts of different things that's really, really good for you. And um, But that was the biggest eye-opening experience to realize we spend all this time and effort and money to raise our animals. But even if you are supporting your local farmer or if you're buying your meat from Whole Foods or at a natural grocery store, it's getting more and more expensive and because of that, you want to be careful with what you put in your food and in yeah. your bones. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And definitely think about something like that bone broth that you're boiling for so long. You've got that nice simmer going and you're like trying to pull out all the nutrients of everything. And then you're like, wait, I'm pulling out all the chemicals in everything that I'm putting in there. Also, um, we, we all have these aha moments where it's like, oh, you know, if it's not the Asian side, it's maybe the bay leaves. Like, what are they doing to the bay leaves you're putting in there or the black peppercorns or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I've got to tell you, I love chicken pho. Yeah. I absolutely, absolutely love it. And um, at some point, you know, growing up in Southern California, we had access to a lot of different cultural restaurants around us. I went to college um, in like a suburb of Los Angeles. So I had kind of every ethnicity around me and great restaurants, amazing grocery stores. Like I could get anything that I wanted. But when I moved away from that area, all of a sudden I couldn't go get pho wherever I wanted. <laughs> and so I figured, okay, well, I'm a good cook. I can figure out how to make this at home. Um, so I took a class, actually an online class to learn how to make a more traditional Vietnamese pho. And uh, for those of you guys don't who don't know, this is kind of, uh, pho would be kind of the uh, could you say like the chicken noodle soup of the Vietnamese world? Yes. So, you you know, yeah. Right. It's kind of a noodle soup with chicken. And I love, we just load it filled with raw, crunchy vegetables. Yeah. And I'm totally with your mom. It has to have cilantro and green onions. Like don't give me mint. Some people want to put mint in there, like mm -hmm. cilantro and green onions. It's a must, <laughs> but um but in taking this class, like she really took us through making this great bone broth and was crunching up the bones even so you could really get the, the goodness out of the bones. 
But then she made this super strong case for using MSG. Mm-hmm. And she's like, it's okay. It's not bad for you. It's, tr- you know, traditional. Well, I happen to know my sister gets incredibly sick off of MSG. Mm-hmm. Um, she like instantly, she will break out in hot, like, oh, it's a terrible reaction. I'm, I'm thinking, I don't think I can go along with that argument. I know that there are some forms of like a hydrolyzed yeast that are in nap that are natural, but the chemical version that you add to your food to me is just like, why, why does Asian food have kind of the reputation for having MSG in it? And why did it get in there in the first place? What, what would the answer be for traditional cooking? The, so very, I'm so glad you brought this up because I'm very passionate about it. (laughs) (laughs) Traditional Asian or most Asian food is known for the umami flavors, right? It's that savory flavor that hits the back of your tongue and it makes you crave coming back for more. Um, Now, if you cook your food traditionally, those flavors will come out in time. But when you go to a restaurant, for example, and they're looking at time, resources, profit, mostly, they're not going to be simmering their bone broth for 24 hours, right? And so what they're going to do instead is they're going to be putting the MSG in there, all sorts of different flavor enhancers to get you to come back. Um, it's, It's an excitotoxin, MSG, monosodium glutamate, and it is terrifyingly just detrimental for your health, your brain health. And my mom would have a severe reaction to MSG whenever we went out to restaurants. She has had heart palpitations, um, atrial fibrillation, where her heart just beats out of control. And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, we really have to remove this from our diet. And and it's not even that we added it to our food when we were cooking at home, but it's in a lot of ingredients in the sauces and condiments again. And so in removing all of that, and it's, it's the irony is whenever we had had to go out to eat at restaurants and eat Vietnamese pho, chicken pho or beef pho, I'd always tell the girls or tell the children, make sure you don't drink the broth. And the irony of that is that's why you're supposed to be eating pho is to drink the broth. But they love it so much. And sometimes, you know, if I didn't prepare anything like that, that a prayer, prepare ahead of time to make our own pho or bring our own, then that's what we have to, those are our options and they're really craving it. But it, you know, it, it started off as um, definitely a flavor enhancer. Restaurants had brought it in. I believe you can look into the military had brought it in um, to get our soldiers to eat the food. Um, And over time, it, you know, has gotten into mainstream. And now there's a whole campaign on how MSG is good for you because you'll eat less salt. Mm -hmm. And I think if uh, you and I are on the same page and most of the (laughs) listeners here, salt is good for you. Uh, real salt, unrefined salt is, and um, not the iodized, of course, then I could see where they may be coming from that perspective, but none of that is healthy at all. (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing how far down the wrong path you can get when you just start going down that path, like, well, you know, let's stop eating the bad salt. So we'll give you another chemical instead. And you know, it's like, wait, 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 whoa, you know, let's back up and just get some really good nutrition in our body. And we don't even have to deal with a lot of those things, It just kind of saves it. So really cooking at home, the long, slow cooking, the letting the flavors develop and letting your food like naturally start to break down a little bit during the cooking process. All of those things are going to bring out that deep umami flavor and you don't even need the MSG. It's just not necessary. Yeah. I mean, you can make the argument that's the most economical way to cook and especially starting with broth. That's the first thing that I would recommend is, you know, I'm maybe hands on 10 minutes to make my chicken pho. And actually, to that point, we'll be releasing our uh, pho masterclass. And I'm going to show you how to make chicken pho without all the MSG and how to prepare it, how to cut it, the Japanese method. So you're, you're parting out your chicken and you have the carcass and you're taking the clean carcass and making broth out of that in literally in, in under an hour. But, you know, it's really just 10 minutes at most of hands-on time and you're just letting it sit on the stove, right? And you're talking about maybe $25 for a real pasture-raised chicken nowadays, but 
you can feed your entire family off of that. Because right now, I think a bowl of pho in California, I was just there, is like $18. Oh, wow. Apparently, it's crazy. <laughs> That is crazy. The prices just keep going up. It surprises me. I'm so insulated because we're like you. We grow all of our own meat. Yeah. We grow almost all of our vegetables, most of our own dairy. Like most of what we do, we're growing here. And so I go to the grocery store and I'm like, oh my gosh, how do people afford this? Like I'm horrified because I just haven't paid attention to prices for so yeah. many years now. Yeah. And, you know, it really, it's shocking. But I just absolutely love nutrient dense food is often poor people's food, right? Like yes. the, the, mm -hmm. the off casts, like the awful from the organ meat, you know, nobody wants to eat that nowadays. It used to be people understood. And in other cultures, people do understand the value of that. But here in the United States, it's like that those are the cheap cuts because nobody wants to eat liver. Like it's just not happening in most people's households. You know, the bone broth, it's so incredibly good. You get so much out of it. And yet it costs the scraps of a meal yeah. to make it. And, you know, like you said, not even a lot of time. In fact, you can do it right in your, you know, slow cooker. If you're like, I'm going to be gone all day, I'll just stick yeah. it in the slow cooker and do it there. Um, and so I, I really, same thing, the fermented foods. Mm -hmm. You know, a head of cabbage is pretty inexpensive to exactly. end up with a superfood that is like going to really revolutionize your health. And it costs almost nothing to make a bit of good salt, a bit of cabbage. And here you go. You know, you've got some amazing foods. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just absolutely love that we have a lot available to us, especially when things are getting more and more expensive. We just have to learn how to slow down and how to use it to its greatest potential for our health. Exactly. And I had, I grew up this way because we had to, my parents didn't make a lot of money. And the only thing, I mean, we didn't throw anything away. We couldn't afford to, but I also couldn't talk about it to any of my like school peers um, growing up in America. So I couldn't tell them, you know, we we're cooking chicken feet or using chicken neck or chicken liver. I mean, there's a, there's an example in the book where I talked about uh, pork, pork floss, which is a dehydrated pork and it it's very fine, but you can salt it and put it on the shelves and, you know, as a busy mom, that's kind of what mom did. Mom just sent me to school with rice and pork floss and then some fermented vegetable, which smells so bad. It's like sour, you know, <laughs> sending your kid off to school with sauerkraut. And so I would open it up at school and my, my peers were saying like, ew, what is that dog hair? Like, you know, so all these things. And, and when I wrote the book, I wrote the chapter for awfuls because I'm like, this book is going to be redemptive of my childhood. <laughs> And Chelsea Green said, why don't you put the chicken liver in the chicken section or put the beef tongue in the beef section? And I said, no, we're keeping it a separate chapter because as people realize this is the most nutrient dense parts of the animal. I didn't know that growing up, um, but my mom would say things like, oh, this is healthy. She would say the oxtail is the healthy, one of the most healthiest cuts of the cow. Mm -hmm. But like, I didn't learn that in school because I grew up in America. A lot of these things mom would say, and I'm like, well, I can't validate it. There wasn't like a scientific study or you can back it up with research, you know, and the, 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 and the youngest. So I'm always questioning everything. <laughs> now, now that I've become a mom myself, I've hit my forties. I've now come to appreciate, I can say this on live TV now, but like I've come to appreciate a lot of what my mom has taught with her ancient wisdom, her traditional wisdom that she knew. And, you know, she would say a lot of things during my postpartum phase where she said, you know, keep your head covered. And I was like, I don't want to keep my head covered. I put my, I know our bed was right by the window. And that next morning I had the worst migraine. And I said, oh, there must be something to this. Like you're supposed to keep your body warm for healing and all sorts of things that I've totally dismissed as a child. And now coming back to realize, oh, this is the way we're supposed to live. This is the way we're supposed to take care of our family. This is the way we're supposed to take care of our animals, how we're supposed to prepare our food to be most nourishing for, for our family. And um, yeah, it's been a humbling experience. <laughs> Oh, definitely. I Now, I have to tell you my story with chicken feet because, of course, my story with chicken goes long before my experience with chicken feet as food. <laughs> so we, my mom even had chickens as I was growing up. And so, of course, when I start hearing chicken feet 
like in a broth, immediately I think of the bottom of the chicken coop and I'm going, yeah, there's no way that is going in my kitchen at all. Like that is so gross. I don't know how you could ever get it clean enough to convince me yeah. that it's coming into the kitchen. Well, that was, I did not realize at that point that chicken feet actually have a skin on them that, that peels off when a chicken is properly done. That's so right. now, now we always put our chicken feet inside our carcass, kind of like with the liver or the heart. Okay. So that I end up with two nice chicken feet every time I pull a chicken out because yeah. we make broth from that. Um, but then in the last few years, we said, well, this is silly. We're not using the heads. We should be using the heads. And so um, we started then also cutting the necks and the heads off, keeping them together and putting that also inside the carcass. Well, a couple of years ago, my son started raising some chickens to sell to neighbors and, uh, you know, these amazing pasture fried chickens. And we butchered our personal chickens and his chickens to sell all in the same day. So it didn't even occur to me, most people are not used to chicken feet, let alone chicken heads inside the chicken carcasses. And so we stuffed them all in there and everybody was a really good sport, but we definitely got some very surprised people to have a chicken head looking at them when they open their package of chicken. And, you know, all totally clean, defeathered, everything. But, you know, this for me is such an important part of learning, um, learning more about making better use of our food and really making use of the nutrient density that we have to offer that we're just kind of tossing out as an American culture. And so getting used to something like having a chicken head floating around in the pot, that's, it takes a while to get <laughs> used to that. But on the other hand, it's something we're literally throwing away and it has so much nutrients, there's so many nutrients in there yeah. that it's really actually quite foolish that we just toss it because we have a little bit of a stigma or, you know, I mean, it's a little odd to have something looking at you out of the pot. Um, we have a great story of getting to film with Sally Fallon Morell in her kitchen and coming in one day and she had taken the chicken feet and she had them perched on the edge of the pot. And she was like, let me out, let me out. It was, it was absolutely hilarious. Cause if you know, Sally Fallon Morell at all, she's actually, you know, she's very much a lady and very straight laced. And <laughs> so that, that was her goofing off, but I love it that you're including things like the awful in there to help start using some of these things yeah. that we have. Yes. And one of the biggest things that I wanted to make clear was to make all of this beautiful. Yeah. Because I think, and that's that's why the the photography in the book is something that I really wanted to nail down, because traditional Asian food can look pretty gnarly, especially if you have it already cooked, right? Mm -hmm. But I wanted to show them that, you know, I, I believe that digestion starts with your eyes, and so if I can capture them, capture you, the reader, with that, and realizing that hey, there's beauty in our food. And, and to inspire you to cook this way, you're going to be feeding your yourself and your family so much more nutrition than you would going out to the local restaurant. And, and so that's, that's really the whole impetus of the cookbook. I mean, the cookbook woke me up to the food industry mm -hmm. and helped me make applesauce from scratch. And so my desire for this cookbook is to, it's funny, it's a closed loop system. It's full, coming around full circle that, you know, here I am writing this cookbook because I'm hoping that there's a family out there, at least one that will change their lives around and who knows if that one cookbook for applesauce changed my life and has changed us to start our farm here. Um, I would love to see that with another family out there. Oh, that is wonderful. And I think that is definitely going to happen with your book. It is definitely beautiful. I was blown away. I, I got to see a preview copy and all of the pictures on that copy were all black and white. And even with all black and white, like not on photo paper or anything like that, I was like, oh wow, this is beautiful. And then I got the color copy and it made it made me hungry just flipping through it. So I think you're very right. Like you see those pictures and your digestion starts. You know, you start thinking, ah, this is good food. I'm excited about this. Um, but just you know, introducing people to the way they can take control of their health in their very own kitchens 
the way they can start sourcing food. You talk about that a little bit in the book. Start sourcing food for your kitchens, food that's good for you, food that's not going to have all of those hidden things in there. Um, I think it's going to make a really big impact. And I'm I'm excited to have it in my kitchen. But hey, you need to keep us posted when you do release your masterclass on pho making because I am definitely going to take the non-MSG version of a pho making class. <laughs> well, it's already recorded. And I believe by the time this uh, podcast comes out, I'll have it out and available. Oh, so good. Can. Okay. So so we'll try and get you guys a link there uh, so we can help you start making some food that way. But in the meantime, or in addition, make sure you grab a copy of The Nourishing Asian Kitchen and go check out Sophia over at her website. It's HTTPS uh, colon slash slash sprinklewithsoil.com. Again, that's sprinklewithsoil.com and go check her out over there. Um, I think you're gonna love what you see. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Sophia, for joining us. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for having me. It's an honor to be here. Okay. Goodbye, you guys.